Hey, I haven't been wearing my glasses for a few months. I'm still, I never got in the habit. I, um, I found them and I gotta wear them. Just, it's easier on my eyes. Uh, I don't like it. Anyway, um, I was just, somebody said on my wall, you know, the, uh, just responding that the church really is the sign. The apostasy of the church really is a sign that this has to be the end of the church age because you can't find the gospel anywhere, you know. And it is true that the apostasy's been here since the beginning. The, you know, the, think about living in the dark ages in the Roman Catholic Church. I can't even imagine. Uh, so we, you know, uh, however, uh, certainly there are times when the apostasy becomes noteworthy and the rank and file Christian who has access to the word is in the word all the time is fighting against the gospel that's I think the difference between now and the dark ages they didn't have access to the word it was the institutions that were fighting against the gospel and they would persecute those who did discover the word uh, but most people didn't understand what was happening except the ones that were in the word and that was the relatively few that found it but when you know something different is happening is when everybody and their brother study in the Bible. You know, one of the things that happened with the prophetic awakening in the last... God said in Ezekiel that the Gentiles would return to the Word when Israel returned to the land. Because it's a great sign uh, that shows that he is sovereign author of history... And they were, the Gentiles at large were blaspheming the name of God when Israel was not in the land because they're his people and his covenants are not being kept. Well, now God prophesied to the mountains that he would multiply man and beast on them. It's not even really the people that are the object of those prophecies in Ezekiel 36 and 37 right now. It's the mountains. God spoke to the mountains that he would they were desolate, they laid desolate, and they were trampled underfoot by the Gentiles for, as a judgment on the people, while the people were scattered, but then he would repopulate them, and would, they'd bear fruit, and they would, uh, man and beast would be populated on them again, and he would also regather Israel, but in unbelief. They're in unbelief right now, they're not his people yet. When they're grafted back in, they will be. But um, those who believe the gospel after the church is removed, when the 144,000 are sealed, there will be a believing remnant of Israelites uh, that believe that Jesus is the Lamb of God and the Messiah, um, who will be the servants of God to preach uh, the gospel, I believe, during the tribulation, or during the 70th week of Daniel. And I believe that they will be the ones who bring in the greatest harvest in the history of the world. Um, but anyway, right now they are in unbelief, but they're in the land. And there are Israelites. There are Israelites in the land. And that is a sign to the Gentiles that for the last 50 years has caused the Gentiles to go back to the Word. And, and uh, the Gentiles have been in the Word. And I mean, everybody and their brother had prophecy charts, you know, uh, and I'm not talking about all the, yes, of course we live in a post-Christian culture and people are turning away from the church and all that stuff, but the rank and file, so-called, you know, since the holiness movement in the fifties and everything, people have returned back to the word, uh, people are, Christians are in the Bible, Protestant Christians are in the Bible. Whether they've got psalms or devotionals or Christian songs or Christian church culture or whatever, they're in the Word. And yet they're coming up, seeking to establish their own righteousness, building on law of righteousness, and now they've been given a megaphone with social media to reveal what they really believe, whereas in the institutional church they can't because they just sit silently in the pew. And they're trolls and wolves. They're taking the way of Cain, and they're articulating the worst heresies, and anywhere they can find someone who believes the gospel,
gospel of grace, they rail against them. Okay, and that's not the pastors alone. That's the rank and file. I would call it rank and file. There really shouldn't be such a term, but that's the average Joe Christian who's in the Bible all the time. That's different than the Dark Ages. The apostasy is different. It's it's saturated everybody. Uh, it's when the people who are who are supposedly representing the truth um, are fighting against it. Those are the apostates. And now it's not just uh, people in wearing costumes. It's everybody. That's what's different. So some people say, well, you know, the apostasy has been here all along. Can you imagine living in the dark ages? No, I cannot. You know, the inquisitions were awful and that's true. But what we have is different in that most people who read the Bible are fighting against the gospel. <laughs> and Christians are testifying who just believe the grace of God that they're being persecuted in their homes, uh, not invited to family functions, um, shunned by communities, etc. Okay, enough of that. Um, what I was going to say is that in this apostasy, it's amazing how every single verse of the Bible, every chapter, is leavened in our interpretations so that we always get it wrong. And all you have to do is stop and think, well, what's Paul talking about there? Or what's the apostle thinking, talking about there? And God just unlocks the whole thing and you realize, holy cow, the traditional teaching is so far off, it's ridiculous. Uh, and somebody texted me today and said, you know, now that I'm not a legalist anymore, when I read 1 Corinthians 13, that sounds legalistic to me. It sounds like a demand. You know, the love chapter. And that's because it's always been interpreted individually as if this is how you're supposed to live. And this is talking about how you, you know, love always, love never fails and love hopes all things and believes all things and it never remembers an ill and it always, you know, it's all this stuff about love and and you think he's talking about you and your personal life with your, your relationship dynamics towards others, but he's not. He's talking about the gifts of the Spirit in the meetings, especially the desire to prophesy. Um, and he's comparing the actual profitable operation of the gifts of the Spirit uh, to... He's contrasting it with the operation of the phony gifts in the hands of the wolves and the false teachers who are Judaizers, flesh, uh, puffed up in the flesh, law boasters, self-righteous. He says they're slapping you in the face and you tolerate it. Uh, they bring another Jesus and another gospel. They're backloading works into the gospel and they're abusing the saints. And, and they've got a meeting that's very different than what we have. When you come together, each one has. And one has a psalm, one has a prophecy, one has an interpretation, one has... And they're all to prophesy one by one. They don't have just one man speaking. They have a manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit for the profit of all. And they're all to desire to prophesy. And the problem at Corinth is that the Corinthian saints, the carnal ones, want to emulate the false ones. And the false ones operate in a display of bravado and what looks like spiritual greatness in the meetings. But it's false because they don't even have the gospel right. And they're loading all their teaching and preaching and prophesying and psalming and all the so-called spiritual things that they're doing None of it is motivated uh, by the testimony of Christ and definitely not love for the brethren. It's not edifying. It's tearing down the building. They're building with wood, hay, and stubble. They're destroying the building. They're damaging the conscience, of, the conscience of believers and actually turning them away from the genuine ministry of Christ. And I believe in the meeting, 
it would not surprise me if they were calling out saints and actually reminding of the their individual sins and holding them in front of the whole congregation. Uh, because I've been in meetings like that. I was in a church that practiced that kind of meeting and when it gets abusive, it's really bad. Uh, they think that they're doing the work of God to expose you to everybody. It's sick. Because they, they speak as if it's the oracles of God. Well, so... The way you should read 1 Corinthians 13 is not look at my life and see if I'm walking in love in all these different areas. What you're supposed to be doing is contrasting the ministry of the Spirit and the edification of building up the body of Christ and why you're seeking to speak with the kind of speaking that's coming out of the false teachers and say, is this love? That's what you're supposed to be doing. It always, the, whenever you, um, whenever we take these verses, these chapters out of context and ruin our lives with them, <laughs> we, uh, it's because we individually, in, we turn them on ourselves thinking we're supposed to be looking intra navel gazing and, and looking at ourselves and seeing if we're doing those things and we turn them into a law but it's just like first john you know what we learned about first john was that it is not a book to teach you how to fellowship or test whether you're fellowshipping it was a book to expose the antichrists in their midst to show the believers hey these are not your brothers these people have taken the way of cain they're walking in darkness all their boasts are empty. They claim to love God, but they hate the brethren. They don't have eternal life in them. They claim to have fellowship with God, but they deny they have sin. They're lying. The truth is not in them. They claim to uh, love God, but they don't even recognize the brethren. They don't recognize the testimony of Christ, and they don't recognize that Christ is the perfect. They deny Jesus Christ. They're liars. Uh, and they, he says, well, we write these things to you concerning those who seduce you. And once we saw that 1 John is not writing to the believers so that they would look at themselves and see if they're walking in darkness or not, but to tell them that the people who are bothering them and seducing them are the ones who are in darkness and to remind them that they are in the light, it unlocked the whole book for us. And so many people who were afraid to read that book then enjoyed it. What's well, the same thing with 1 Corinthians, you know? And we, we got up to 1 Corinthians 9 in our playlist. If, 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 if those were good messages, I had to make a turn because uh, I had a f so many new subs and I couldn't keep up um, the messages because people didn't know what I was talking about. But uh, we got to chapter 9, but we were discovering all kinds of things that that book doesn't... that book also doesn't say what we thought and it's not about individual sins that whole church was being brought through something and the root of their problems was not their carnality it was the false teachers um, and when Paul is talking to them in 1 Corinthians 13 he's not talking about their individual love walk he's 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 is about the gifts of the spirit and it's all about uh, eventually the operation of the gifts of the Spirit in the meetings and their desire to emulate the false teachers. And he's wanting them to see these are ministers of Satan. You don't want to. You don't want to emulate them. And let me show you the character of the ministry of the Holy Spirit versus what they're operating in. And if you just pick your favorite false teacher who's obviously a wolf, who's taken the way of Cain, and listen to the way they talk, or think about the way they rail at people on the walls, and hold first, hold them up to 1 Corinthians 13, it's a sharp contrast. And you go, that that's not of God. What they're doing is not of God. I remember in the last message I posted, uh, it was a re repost of uh, a message from long time ago um, about, you know, Peter, do you love me? Agape Phileo. 
And the context of that was all these dreamers were saying that I wasn't saved because I didn't love God and I didn't love the brethren. And the reason they said I didn't love the brethren was because I told us, uh, someone with a channel that they're sharing hyper-dispensationalist memes and they're wrong and those are an error. And they interpreted that, that they were personally attacked and they went on this campaign with all these dreamers, started having dreams about me that I was a false teacher and sharing them all over the internet and uh, that I wasn't saved. And then they started teaching that I wasn't saved because I don't walk in love because I call out error. And then they were boasting in their love for God and saying they love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And they know that I'm not saved because I don't. And I said, no, you don't love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. You're boasting in law righteousness. And uh, I was using that, 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 um, sorry, that message was in the context of that whole thing that was going back and forth. Uh, but it's funny because these people were so full of hatred. I mean, and their walls were just exploding with darkness. The people on their walls were all offended. They'd all taken the way of Cain. And actually, that's when we started teaching what the way of Cain was. The way of Cain is to reject uh, the brethren, to, to hate the brethren because they take refuge in the blood of Jesus Christ and insist that they have no righteousness of their own. You hate someone because they do that. Um, and that's what they were doing. And they were clearly showing that they were in darkness. Um, but 1 Corinthians 13 held up to them would just... It just showed so clearly the difference between a ministry which seeks to edify and people that are puffed up in the flesh only care about themselves and use their so-called platform of ministry to tear people down. That's what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 13. But it's also illustrative of how far gone we are. That almost every verse, every chapter, every book, our default interpretation that we've inherited traditionally, and it's from pastors, is polar opposite of what it actually is intended to speak to. And you've got to question how you see that verse. You cannot assume that the way you've always thought about that chapter should be the way you continue to think about it. You know, there's a lot of people that are getting their minds renewed about the truth and starting to see things, but they have a mix of the old and new, and when they go back to the other things that they, let's say that there's things that we haven't covered in the truth, they're not necessarily going, okay, I need to suspend my views about all these chapters and start from scratch. They're trying to, they just kind of go back to their old way of thinking whenever it comes to any other chapter. Can't do that. Every single chapter needs to be looked at with fresh eyes and the Holy Spirit will help you. All you have to do is say, what is Paul talking about here? Take yourself out of the equation. You know, uh, is he really talking about the individual here? He almost never is. The apostles that are addressing churches, not individuals. What is he talking about here? And in that case, in 1 Corinthians 13, he's talking about the gift from 12 to 14. He's talking about the gifts of the spirit, the operation of the gifts and the character of the ministry, uh, and how it would be expressed in meetings. Um, and he's wanting the Corinthians to see the difference between the operation of the Holy Spirit and his nature versus the false ministers and how they're operating so that they can clearly see, you know, after they would get something like that, if a false minister were to operate the way they normally operate in the meeting, they would not hear a chorus of amens. It would be uncomfortable and awkward silences because we read Paul. And you're clearly proving him right. You know, it exposes. These letters are so profound. They just absolutely expose the darkness. Once you shine the light at the right object, the thing gets exposed. But the problem is, is we always want to turn the light and shine it at ourselves, thinking it's here to expose us. 
No, love covers a multitude of sins. We're under the blood. We're not supposed to be reading the New Testament and always looking at ourselves. We're supposed to be looking away from ourselves to Christ. And then we're supposed to be seeing what is it that the apostle is saying? What is he addressing here? Take yourself out of the equation. Hide yourself in Christ when you read the Bible. Then you can at least get an understanding of what the apostle is saying. Then, as you're moving, the Holy Spirit might bring something to light to judge about your flesh. But you don't start there. <laughs> You've got to start in Christ and find out what is actually even being said. 90% of the time, we've got the whole thing wrong because we take that light and we shine it on ourselves uh, and put ourselves under law and we come up with the absolute inverse of the interpretation or the wrong interpretation of the verse and chapter and a screwy, messed up Bible that doesn't say anything. Okay, well, I just wanted to append that. Uh, I'll talk to you later.